Well, a very good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of Dr. Reema Bansal and the team at PGI Chandigarh, I welcome you all to the course. Uh, this is the instruction course on learning lessons in uveitis practice and I can see Reema coming here. So it has co-instructors Dr. Manisha Agarwal, Padma Malini, myself, Dr. Biswas, Mudit and of course Reema. So Reema is going to take up the introduction and carry on with the course. Lessons, le learning lessons in uveitis practice and I'm happy to have my co-instructors Dr. Manisha Agarwal who's from Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, New Delhi, Dr. Padma Malini Mahindra Das from Narayana Netra Le Bangalore, Dr. Vishali from PGI Chandigarh and Dr. Biswas from Shankar Netra Le Chennai, Dr. Mudit Tyagi. So we have aimed this instruction course for highlighting the fine nuances in clinical practice and you know sometimes things are made very complicated but if you have very simple clues and simple uh, lessons and you know key messages it becomes easy to diagnose and treat these patients in uveitis. So we'll hear from all the experts and since I'm seeing since morning there is a significant overlap between various talks for each speaker everybody's going here and there so I don't see all the instructors here. So may I have um, Dr. Vishali first. Manisha will be joining us. So Dr. Vishali is the president of Ubiitis Society of India. Ye aap change kar dijiye. She's heading the uh, Ubiitis in vitro retina services in PGI. So we'll have your questions at the uh, end during the panel discussion. So we'll have speakers first. And in case some speaker is late, then we can take up the questions in the middle. So Dr. Vishali will be talking on clinical signs do not corroborate with the lab investigations. So how do we proceed then? What are the probable scenarios that you would have the situation sitting in the clinic? First is, it could just be the wrong labs were ordered. So, I mean, you have a patient with, which looks like toxoplasma, but somehow you ordered or somebody else ordered CMV titles from the blood. Now CMV comes positive. What will you do? Nothing. CMV was not even requ required. So just ignore the labs. The second is the lab investigations were ordered which were non-standardized and it used to happen a lot with TB. ELISA for TB positive. Probably everybody is positive. But it's not the standardized lab. So just ignore labs. The third scenario is that lab results have arrived when the patient is already responding to whatever treatment you were giving and like you were treating it say for example for toxo and the patient is responding and now the TB comes positive. Would you treat? No, you will not treat because patient is responding so you would ignore the labs again. And fourth is the lab results are equivocal you are not sure whether they are good, bad, or how to interpret. Just investigate further, but do not panic simply because you have one lab report positive from somewhere or, and initiate the patient treatment. So the moral of the story is treat the patient and not the labs. How do you go about it? The first example is the labs were ordered in a wrong setting. Now this is the patient who first presented to our colleagues in private practice. So this was the scenario. The patient was ordered test for TB. PPD came out to be positive. 
So patient was started on anti-TB drugs with steroids. So when they gave steroids and anti-TB drugs, there was no response. There was increase in this yellowish area and there were this exudative detachment inferiorly both the eyes. What went wrong? This is not choroiditis. Choroid has an anatomy which can either be focal or diffuse. Choroid will not get inflamed in a linear pattern like this. This is the deposition of fibrin. And when you do fluorescein angiography, you see multiple points of leak which are hyper and increasing in the late phase. Choroiditis active will be hypo to hyper. These are expanding dot signs. Now the expanding dot signs in both the eyes, they are a evidence for fibrinous type of CSC or CSR which was commonly called central serous chorioretinopathy. So this was the wrong scenario to order the labs. Why would you order labs for a patient with CSC? Now the patient has come positive with Montu, so you give him treatment. What should you do? You should ignore these labs are rather not ordered in the first place. So what we did, we simply stopped anti-TB drugs. We simply stopped all the steroids. And this is how patient responded in both the eyes, the fibrin kind of resolved and the fluid disappeared. The second scenario is, is the lab that you have ordered a standard test or not? Because many physicians take decision based on serology and other tests which should not have been done because their positivity does not mean anything. And the examples are antibodies against the EMV herpes or serological test for TB. So if you have a patient who is walking around with these tests, please these tests need to be ignored. Now this is a 24 year old young girl who has multiple scotomas. She is a myope and as you can see here, these are the lesions which are very suggestive of PIC that is punctate inner choroidopathy. And this is how the OCT shows. PIC is very common in myopic women, young women, and this is very typical. Where you have RP elevation with sub-RP hyperreflective signals, subtle outer retinal disruption, intact Brooks membrane. Now, patient is carrying the report of high titers of CMV IgG. Just ignore it because they don't have the any relevance in this scenario your diagnosis is pick why should some xyz lab make you change your diagnosis or make you start antiviral therapy the third scenario was lab results have arrived when the patient is already responding to whatever treatment you started because many times in uveitis some of the labs take about two to three weeks to respond and by that time either you would have given some primitive therapy or the disease would be showing its course. So if it is responding to whatever you did in the beginning before the lab results came and the lab results indicate, you know, something different, don't change. This is an example of a 23 year old man who came with healed multifocal choroiditis in one eye and active granuloma. The visual acuity was hand motion. Uh, tuberculin skin test positive, CT chest normal. So he actually underwent a diagnostic vitrectomy. Uh, this was the fluorescein showing increased leak from the granuloma. And one week after vitrectomy, his vision was improving and he was on ATT. Now PCR from the vitreous, because we send it for everything, comes positive for toxo. Would I change it to toxo? No. I would just doubt whether it is a false positive test because if you can see the patient is already responding to our anti-TB drugs and whatever we have done. So if the patient is responding, do not change your results based on this. So we continued. As you can see, the patient continues to respond to therapy. So lab result could be just wrong. The fourth is investigate further based on the labs but do not initiate treatment yet. If you really feel lab results have some meaning, go further. Now, this is a 60 year old woman who was symptomatic for six months. Vision is 618 in the right eye and counting finger in the left eye. 
she had aqueous and vitreous cells in both the eyes and was being managed on azathioprine and its steroids there was not much difference so you can see these multiple granulomatous scapes inflammation vitreous so aqueous tab comes positive for tuberculosis pcr however Patient gives history 5 years earlier she had undergone Whipple's procedure for periampullary carcinoma and she did was carcinoma was restricted to duodenum and this is the reports that we got from her so this is the case where you are not really thinking of tb you are thinking of masquerade test for tb comes but there is a granulomatous inflammation and your oncology says the Uh, malignancy is taken care of so these are the kind of scenarios where you will not hurry to start anti tb drugs simply because the montus is positive but still it could again be tb in a patient with treated cancer so you would wait and investigate further to see what it could be so pcr for cmv was also positive and then when we did il6 ten ratio it showed increased il10 which was indicative of malignancy rather than inflammation so we persisted with went on to diagnostic ppv which showed malignant cells and then we ordered mri which shows there was metastasis from the primary disease so if the investigation in scenario 4 puts you in doubt investigate further but do not jump on to start treatment if you are not very convinced about that lab result and lastly which is the dictum treat the patient and not the labs thank you very much reema for the opportunity thank you ma'am so these cases were wonderful i'm sure you've learned a lot on how to just you know pay attention to labs sometimes and pay attention to the clinical sometimes so clinical science and you have to maintain a balance between what you are seeing and what you are treating so thank you very much ma'am any questions you can take uh, down and by the time we have next speaker uh, we have dr padma dr padma is from narayana netralaya she is the head of uveitis services and she'll be talking on top 3 mistakes in the treatment of uveitis So as I said earlier, this instruction course is totally case-based, and we want you to just pick up the key points from the simple cases that we see every day in our clinics. So we see now Manisha entering. Manisha will be talking on top three mistakes in diagnosis of uveitis. So we have split up. So over to you, Padma. all of you thank you dr reema for the opportunity i'll be talking to you of mistakes in the treatment of uveitis with a case example corticosteroid it's a gold standard in controlling the inflammation whether it's an infective or inflammatory but however if it's not used in appropriate terms it can lead to complications whatever the route in which we administer either it could be topical or periocular or systemic use we'll start with the case 1 here is a 38 year male presented with complaints of recurrent anterior uveitis in 2012 was using steroids on and off associated with increase in intraocular pressure for which he was using anti glaucoma medication that is combination of bromonidin and timolol best character visual acuity is 66 and n6 with the medications intraocular pressure was under control in the left right eye was absolutely normal the left eye shows the central keratic precipitates the flare and gonioscopy angle was open fundus was normal in 2012 so rec- we did suspect in view of central keratic precipitates which is associated with increase in intraocular pressure viral etiology was suspected anterior chamber paracentesis was done negative for herpes simplex varicella zoster and cmv virus 
So we assume that we ruled out the viral and we treated the patient with topical steroids and anti-glaucoma medications. I had many episodes of recurrences which was managed and systemic workup was negative. So patient presented again with blurring, heaviness and halos around the lie in 2016. Oh, using anti-glaucoma medication, in spite of that the intraocular pressure was high. It is 35 millimeters of mercury in the left eye. Fundus examination could see a pigmented keratic precipitates, prominent corneal nerves, AC reaction, cells were 2 plus. By then, the left eye showed disc changes suggestive of a glaucomatous disc. Again, we did suspect the viral, we did the AC tap. This time, AC tap for the CMV came positive. Confocal microscopy was done for academic interest, which also showed central globular identity and infiltrative pattern suggestive of infective etiology. At this point, topical anti-glaucoma medication, such as valganciclovir gel, was added. So this is the thing. At the time of presentation, PCR was negative. Repeated episodes was treated with symptomatically. But in the second thing, when patient again had a classical features, ACTAP for PCR for CMB came positive. So whenever we have a clinical picture, suspicion of viral etiology, one PCR negative does not rule out the infective etiology. We have to closely monitor them and watch out for this. Once we put appropriate antiviral therapy, it results in resolution of the inflammation. We are seeing more number of CMV anterior uveitis in immunocompetent individuals now. So, coming to the learning point from this case, recurrent viral anterior uveitis needs treatment with high index of suspicion. ACTAP for PCR viruses may not be positive in all the cases. We need to repeat the test. Confocal can be used as an in indirect measure to show the infective pattern of keratic precipitates in CMV anterior uveitis. We will move on to the next case. So, posterior saponone steroid injection and is equally. Here is a 33 year male, defective vision in both eyes since one month. History of fever with rashes one and a half months back for which no diagnosis could be made even after being thoroughly investigated even was hospitalized for that. Patient gave history of scrotal herpes few years back and is a known diabetic. Patient has seen elsewhere his old records had a picture like this where he had block fluorescence in the early phase with staining and disc leakage in the late phase. So, OCT old record showed hyperreflectivity with after shadowing effect. So they thought it could be a, a fever with retinitis, post fever retinitis, since he is a diabetic and he had a her, uh, scrotal herpes, they gave a posterior saplinon injection to control the inflammation. The patient shows presented with when the patient presented to us. He had decreased vision in both eyes. The best keratal visual acuity was 624. AC reaction was there. In addition to that, there were vitritis and vitreous haze. There was an hyperemia of the disc with retinitis in the posterior pole. This is a close-up picture. The left eye also patient had medium KPs with vitritis with vitreous cells. Had presentation to us, had altered foveal contour. Hyperreflectivity with the after shadowing effect with hyperreflective dots was seen with SRF. So this is the old record picture and this is the new presentation picture. Investigations, most of the co causes for the post fever like was negative, chikungunya, dengue, uh, autoimmune workup was also negative, toxoplasma titers were also negative. ACTAP PCR was advised. CMB came positive. This is a nested PCR showing positivity for CMB virus. So we added the systemic valganciclovir and patient received intravitreal ganciclovir 2000 microgram in 0.1 ml. Intravitreal injection of vivacizumab also was given to the right in view of CMB. Patient received multiple intravitreal ganciclovir injections, total of 8 injections over a period of 2 months. This is at presentation, follow up 2 months showing resolving retinitis. So this is a post treatment picture, 
showing resolving retinite resolved retinitis with pale disc in both eyes visual acuity in the right eye was 660 left eye did not improve so important to check the history of herpes zoster and also the control of diabetes and systemic immune status before administering steroids either it could be depo or systemic steroids when one is unsure of the past history better to avoid periocular depo steroid injection there is risk of viral reactivation with retinitis is there with the past history of herpes zoster the next case is systemic steroids without appropriate antimicrobial therapy should not be given let's see here third case is a 58 year female diagnosed have a viral retinitis and pan uveitis not responding to treatment referred for second opinion in 2013 visual acuity in the left eye was 260 the right eye was within normal limits intraocular pressure was normal this is the old photograph at the time of presentation patient had a diffuse pigmented keratic precipitates and vitreous haze with suspected focal areas of retinitis based on this the primary ophthalmologist thought it was a case of a viral uveitis treated with antiviral and steroids patient did not improve so at the time of presentation there was keratic precipitates was slightly better following the steroid therapy however there were pigmented keratic precipitates was present on fundus examination, media haze, hyperemia of the disc, we could see multifocal retinitis with involvement of the arteries, something what we call it as arteriolitis kind of a picture. At this point of time, since the patient did showed worsening and also retinitis with arteriolitis, we thought could it be a toxo. OCT shows the presence of ERM with hyperreflectivity of the vessel corresponding to the sclerosed vessel with retinitis. Serological titer was strongly positive. IgG was 500 IU per ml. ACTAP for PCR came positive for toxoplasma B1 gene. And confocal showed central globular with dentitic pattern of keratic precipitates. We started the patient on antitoxo treatment. Sulfur pyrimethamine and folic acid followed by systemic steroids with topical steroids and cycloplegic agents. In view of extensive involvement, we gave intravitreal clinda along with dexamethasone was given. So following which we could see the resolving retinitis in the left eye. So this case illustrates the possible consequences consequence of systemic steroids and infection with toxoplasmosis because here the steroids was given without appropriate antimicrobial therapy. Similar case have been reported by Klecherush et al. So it's important to rule out toxoplasmosis in retinitis case they may not have classical headlight in the fog with significant vitritis. We do see atypical cases. So molecular diagnostics can help us to confirm the diagnosis in atypical cases. We need to start antitoxoplasmic treatment followed by systemic steroid therapy. If you have a time, I will go to the next case. So case number 4. Whenever we are treating with uveitis, if the patient is not responding to the treatment, we have to watch out for other findings or complication. What are the missing things? Here, 36 year male, known case of seronegative arthritis on topical and systemic steroids. Patient did not improve. There was a worsening of the vision. So that's why the patient was referred to us. On examination, we could see the anterior segment inflammation. And in addition to that, there was significant vitritis and macular edema was also present. So we wanted to know what is happening, why he is not responding. The fundus examination findings were not classical. But when we did the OCT, it showed serious detachment, something like a CSR kind of a picture. So we did the OC FFA which showed classical smoke stack appearance of a leak because this particular patient has associated CSCR that's why following stepping up of steroids there was a worsening. We tapered the steroids then we introduced the systemic immunosuppressive therapy following which we could see the resolving CSCR however when tapered the steroids there was worsening of the inflammation so we have to balance between the two. Learning point to watch out for the response to therapy. Whenever the patient is not responding, your antennas has to go up to find out any other associated changes happening. So without analyzing the case, we should not increase the dose of systemic steroids. Multimodal imaging can help us to find out the underlying associated diseases like CSCR 
or in choroiditis, choroidal neovascular membrane. These are the things we need to rule out. So, retinitis is most commonly associated with infection. Atypical multifocal retinitis in addition to serological, molecular diagnostic can help us to find out the etiology. Systemic steroids should be started only after appropriate antimicrobial therapy in a case of infective uveitis. Non-responder, we need to look out for complications or associated changes in the eye. Thank you for your attention. Any questions, I will be happy to take it up. Thank you Padma for the wonderful cases. So with this, we will take up the questions at the end. So with this, we move now move on to Dr. Uh, Manisha Agarwal, who will be talking on top three, three mistakes in diagnosis of uveitis. Manisha is from Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, and she's heading the vitro retina and uvea services there. So very good evening to all of you, and thank you, Reema. I would be speaking to you on the most common three mistakes that we make in the diagnosis of uveitis. So let us first know what three common mistakes. The first would be that we diagnose an infectious etiology as a non-infectious etiology. The second being that we diagnose it as one infection and it turns out to be another one. And the third one being, the slides are not moving. And the third one being where you have uveitis, which is actually masking an underlying etiology. So these are the three common mistakes that we are bound to make in our practice. Now let's take uh, uh, all these three mistakes by case examples. So first is diagnosing an infectious etiology, which has been diagnosed as a non-infectious etiology. So this is a 68-year-old male patient, and he presents with sudden diminution of vision in the right eye 10 days back, now having a blurring of vision in the left eye for last five days. He has a history of paralysis of left side of face, hypertensive for last six years, and also has a history of CAD with a bypass surgery, which was done way back in 2011 and stopped EcoSpin on his own six months back. He had been diagnosed as a case of a branch retinal artery occlusion in the right eye somewhere else and was then referred. Actually, the patient came on his own because he started now having a blurring of vision in the left eye. So if you see the right eye, the vision was as low as finger counting at 3 meters. There was ONH swelling. There was a retinal edema. So there was no doubt that we were dealing with a BRAO in the right eye. But what apparently the ophthalmologist had missed was an examination, a detailed examination of the left eye. Uh, a peripheral examination of the left eye is something that was missed out in this patient. The patient had a vision of 636 N36 in the left eye. You had an optic nerve head swelling and the patient had this classical tongue-shaped peripheral lesions which you can very well see in the peripheral fundus, very much suggestive of a viral retinitis. The patient underwent, uh, underwent a whole gamut of investigations which very much confirmed the presence of a viral infection and the patient was treated with oral valcyclovir and the ecosprin was continued and also with intravitreal antiviral injections. The patient was also started on oral steroids and the risk of RD was explained. The patient had follow-up uh, at three weeks, the both eyes had dropped to a vision of 3 by 60. We went ahead and we did a 360 degree laser to avoid a retinal detachment in the left eye. The follow up at two months, the patient did not recover much vision in the left eye. So when we reviewed the literature, because it was a learning for us also, we found that vascular complications apparently have been reported with ARN and BRAO has been described as a sign of ARN. A combined vascular occlusion at the initial presentation can subsequently develop ARN in the fellow eye. So here we had an elderly gentleman with a history of CAD diagnosed with BRAO in one eye and referred to the treating cardiologist. Viral retinitis in the re retinal periphery of the other eye apparently was missed and probably the prognosis in the left eye may have been better if it was managed on time. So we went ahead and published our experience in the form of a case report because it was very much a learning for us. The second mistake being diagnosing it as some other infection. So we have this young 18-year-old boy from Bihar with a gradual painless diminution of vision in the left eye for last six months, no significant systemic or a contact history, low socioeconomic status. 
The patient had this huge yellowish subretinal lesion in the macular area with subretinal fluid. And when we did a fundus fluorescein angiography, you found that there was a mottled hyperfluorescence which was seen within this area of the lesion. So the provisional diagnosis, of course, was a subretinal abscess, secondary to most common being tuberculosis, or to some other chronic infection like a fungal infection, and last but not the least, a lymphoproliferative disorder, which was the third on our differential diagnosis list. The patient underwent a baseline investigation where everything else was not really suggestive of any infection, except that the Mantux was zero, and you don't expect the Mantux to be zero in a young child. The patient had a raised ESR which just suggested that the patient had a chronic infection and the man took zero probably because either the child was immunocompromised. So we referred this patient to um, a pediatrician who said that everything looks pretty okay except that the patient was not vaccinated with BCG, the patient was mentally subnormal and the clearance was taken for starting this patient on systemic steroids. So nothing was really conclusive. So what we did, we went ahead and we did a vitreous biopsy for this patient. The gram stain came out to be negative. There was no acid fast bacilli which was isolated. The PCR came out to be negative for MTB and the culture report was awaited. Now since this patient was from Bihar, he was not ready to stay back. So we started this patient on broad spectrum antibiotic in the form of ofloxacin and steroids and the patient went back. The patient did say that he had cough with expectoration. The sputum sample also was sent and it came out to be having only a single acid fast bacilli and the physician was not really convinced to start ATT for a single bacilli. But to our utter surprise, when the culture report came, it showed nocardia species. So here we were actually all doing our investigations, our clinical examination. We kept suspecting tuberculosis, but it came out to be a nocardia infection. So apparently after this culture report, the MRI of the brain was done to rule out intracranial nocardiosis and the patient was started on sulfamethoxazole and trimethopim combination along with oral steroids. And the patient did show a very nice improvement. The vision improved to 618 and N12 with a complete regression of the subretinal fluid and you also find that there's a regression of that yellowish lesion. So this was a rare entity, most commonly affects the choroid and the spread is hematogenous, the nocardial infection and the posterior pole is said to be most commonly affected. As the choroid is thicker with more dense capillaries at the posterior pole, intracranial involvement is common and it's very commonly confused with tuberculosis or a fungal infection. So again, we had a learning from this particular case which we again published as an interesting case report. The last mistake can be that we are missing the underlying diagnosis under the cover of uveitis. Now this has been actually a very great learning for me, 45 year old female patient with diminution of vision in both eyes for last four months and having no history of systemic illness. She was diagnosed to have VKH elsewhere and was already treated with IVMP, high dose of steroids were on and she had also been uh, put on methotrexate and now on azathioprine, still not responding and that is why she came for a second opinion to us. There was no relevant past systemic history. So this is how her fundus of the right eye looked where you had exudative retinal detachment with extensive subretinal glaotic bands. The vision was as low as 1 by 60 less than N36 with no evidence of inflammation which probably could have been taken care by the high dose of steroids and immunosuppressants which she was already on for last quite a few months. We could not find any retinal break, so obviously a regmatogenous RD was out of question. The left eye also has a, had a very extensive exudative detachment and the vision was 624N18 in this eye. So when we evaluated her OCT, we found an evidence of PD and we thought that, okay, fine, we now have a diagnosis of CSCR, which probably this patient is having because of the high oral dose of the steroid that she is on and we were quite convinced about it. So we stopped all the, her medication and she also gave us a very interesting history of alopecia being treated with minoxidil which again is a uh, you know some causative agent for causing CSR. So we thought that we are quite bang on diagnosis and we are dealing with a patient with chronic CSCR and that was the diagnosis. So why did we hold the entire history of treatment against VKH? Because she was getting no response to steroids, including IVMP, which is very unlikely in an inflammatory pathology. 
also there was no response to any kind of an immunosuppressants and she was already on two immunosuppressants so this i've already told you so we gave a trial of eplerenon and we reviewed her in two weeks but apparently there was absolutely no response to this treatment and there was no change on the oct findings so we went back to the patient again we took a detailed history again she gave a history of small nodule in the right breast two years back which was diagnosed to be benign and since we were ourselves lost in the diagnosis we thought okay let's start from here we sent her back for a reevaluation of the breast pump breast lump a physical examination by the oncologist was done and she was found to have uh, you know these uh, nodules in both her breast and she was advised all these gamut of investigations further including a mammogram and ultrasound uh, guided biopsy a pet scan and an mri brain and to our utter shock she was actually having breast carcinoma in both her breasts and she was having metastases involving all parts of her body including spinal cord bones liver brain there was no part of the body which was left without the metastasis a uh, bilateral invasive ductal carcinoma of grade 3 of the breast was the diagnosis made on histopathology and this patient apparently had a very short life span which was left so just to uh, you know conclude my talk this is the patient she underwent a surgical intervention for the exudative rd and we were able to make this patient at least ambulatory to whatever life span was left for her so the clinical pearls to learn from this case was that the patient was not responding to treatment so it was time to revise your diagnosis and that is where we have to restart by taking a detailed history run through all the investigations and take another opinion we may always have something underlying which may be fatal if not detected on time like this in patient so how to avoid these common mistakes a careful history taking from the patient and detailed clinical examination often gives us a clue to the diagnosis we must rule out an infectious etiology before diagnosing it as non infectious and starting the patient on steroids and immunosuppressants we should always be open to read up and revise our diagnosis a regular follow up is absolutely mandatory and uh, i would just take this opportunity to invite all of you to our forthcoming annual conference of uvia society of india which is going to be held in hyderabad on 14 15th and 16th of october the registration is already on so please go ahead and take advantage of an early bird registration and also we have the vrsi conference coming up in nagpur from 2nd to 4th of december so you can register we have a stall in the trade area thank you once again So thank you so much, Manisha. So with this, um, I think we can take up the questions from you, all of you. We uh, we will be waiting for Dr. Mudit and Dr. Biswas, who are having overlapping sessions elsewhere. So by the time they join us, any questions from the audience to Dr. Vishali, to Dr. Padma, and Dr. Manisha? so coming to what we have seen in all the uh, talks so far each case teaches us something or the other so many times we give over treatment like we saw in so many cases they are referred cases over treated with steroids in the form of oral or maybe posterior subtenone it's not really required because what is lacking is the complete examination the patient's history and any clues from the fellow i or from systemic examination and second second point i think all of us know that we have to rule out the infectious etiology before we start the steroids and moreover in uveitis it's not that every case needs treatment there are cases which can be just left alone and watched especially the mimickers so like we saw in dr vishali's case a case of csr where it was you know diagnosed as a choroiditis and a lot of treatment given so all that you have to do is just stop all this and just not give anything or anyone would like to share a case or any particular challenge that you see in your practice yeah please So I wanted to ask two questions. Uh, one is uh, in India specifically, 
uh, what is the role of a man to test because quite often it turns out to be at least minimally positive so what is its relevance in management of uveitis and second thing is we have seen cases where on clinical suspicion and in spite of the physicians uh, saying no we have started patients on empirical anticox treatment and uh, they have improved significantly almost everything is cleared and fine and they complete the cox treatment so what is the take of the faculty on that uh, empirical treatment just based on a clinical suspicion so i think you saw that point being covered in dr vishali's talk we'll come to ma'am so before uh, before we uh, uh, take ma'am's opinion see montuk test does not need to be ordered in every patient of uveitis because uveitis is a simple it's not that complicated as it turns out to be and it is made out to be because we tend up we end up ordering every investigation in every case first just see the patient think about what all possibilities are there so if you have a case of retinitis and you're ordering a montuk and if you have a case of vkh disease you're ordering a montuk even if it is 30 mm it doesn't make sense because we are all exposed we are all likely to be positive so many of us sitting here who do not have uveitis if we do our montuk will be positive so that does not mean that we need treatment for uh, we need anti tb treatment so if your clinical signs are corroborating with tubercular etiology give importance to that otherwise you don't have to so like a case of vkh disease you don't really have to order montuk at all so just see vkh do a fluorescein and do the other imaging tests and start the treatment so um i'll also take a uh, dr vishali's opinion on that because you've seen cases because you know you, your question is pertaining to what happens if the lab tests do not corroborate with your can we have the hand mic please for the co instructors yeah could we uh, what you suggested was that you are suspecting the patient to be tb you have ruled out every other possible etiology you want to start the treatment uh i think montuus is still important about 10 mm even if you get our igra our radiology are a combination of these even if one or other is positive when we say the radiology it will just show you some evidence of heel tb and there will not be any active disease so if any one of them is positive and your phenotype is very strongly suggestive of tb uh, we have already published in our consensus by the courts group that these patients can be started on anti tb treatment both the publications are in general ophthalmology and can be shown to the physician for a reference we can yeah so dr biswas said he will be we are still waiting for the next two speakers but the next session by uveitis uh, international uveitis study group is also uveitis so i think we will take this opportunity to start the session and then take discussion towards the end because dr reema bansal and all others here are the member of iusg so if reema permits we can do sure, that yeah. next session shuru kar rahe hain hum for your information and we will take the discussion together uh when the next session which is actually supposed to be starting at 4:30 but has combined speakers is about do's and don'ts of uveitis for a comprehensive ophthalmologist the pearls from the experts so uh, there is, dr neeta is here okay she is not here so it again comes to my talk then because rupesh is not here and dr biswas is still not here manisha and i am here so my talks is about posterior uveitis pearls for diagnosis and management and manisha will be speaking on systemic therapy for uveitis what comprehensive ophthalmologists need to know ye next session hai please
they would also be confused. Excuse me, audiovisual, next session. So yes. I'm going to give my talk, followed by Dr. Manisha. Then Dr. Biswas, when he comes, he can take up his two talks together for both these sessions so that we are saving time and not waiting. In the meantime, till the time he's putting up the talk, any question related to uveitis, any type of uveitis, discussed, not discussed, any thing, we will be very happy answering it. Just a common point for all of you. Um, yeah. You go. Go ahead. So by so, the time, yeah. Huh. Go, go. So just one point I wanted to highlight. We see a lot of uh, referrals of fuchs uveitis, you know, being treated with steroids, posterior septinol, azithyprine and so on. So just pay, look, uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to these cases with a smoldering infection, very fine KPs which can go missed, you know, on clinical examination. So I just wanted to highlight this as one of the points, learning points in uveitis practice. So, yeah, Manisha, please. So, uh, I'll be speaking on systemic therapy for uveitis, what comprehensive ophthalmologists need to know. The rationale for systemic therapy is that eye diseases are among the most feared health conditions and a survey has shown that 60% people consider blindness as bad as death. Uveitis, is, as you all know, is a potentially site-threatening disease and it can occur due to infection or autoimmune etiology. And the treatment of uveitis is evolving with newer drugs and innovative advances. So my talk basically would be covering the rationale for selecting systemic therapy for uveitis, the use of systemic steroids as the first-line therapy, the use of immunosuppressive therapy, and what are the newer systemic drugs that we have in our armamentarium. Once you have ruled out infection or malignancy, as I showed in my previous case, ocular inflammation is the principal cause of complication in most of the patients. And the control of inflammation is the primary goal, and we have to do it like a firefighting to control the ocular inflammation, which can be very destructive. We have to choose approaches which have early control of inflammation with minimal side effects. Now coming to systemic therapy in uveitis per se, we have it in two phases. One is the induction phase and one is the suppression. The induction phase is the initial phase of control of active inflammation and it is applicable to all the cases and we have to do it as quickly as possible. While suppression is only applicable to the cases which have a chronic inflammation where long-term suppressive therapy is the key to long-term success and good outcomes. The advantages of systemic therapy is it's easily administered, highly effective, easily titrated to achieve a chronic therapy goal, and fewer local side effects than DIPO injections. The disadvantages are that, of course, it is associated with systemic side effects, and the cost of therapy sometimes can be unaffordable. Now, what are the systemic therapies or systemic medications which are available for managing uveitis? We can have NSAIDs, we can have corticosteroids, and we can have immunosuppressive agents, which again, we have various groups like anti-metabolites, anti the T-cell inhibitors, the alkylating agents, and the monoclonal antibodies, which are commonly known as biologics. As far as the systemic NSAIDs are concerned, well, they are very commonly used for scleritis cases, and they are found to be effective in one-third cases. It's prevention for recurrence of anterior uveitis, they can sometimes be used. However, they do not have value for induction treatment of uveitis. They may be more toxic than previously thought, and therefore, uh, you know, they have a limited role in the management of uveitis. And relative contraindications, we all realize peptic ulcer disease, GI intolerance, renal insufficiency, bleeding disorders, these are all uh, indications or contraindications for the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, I think the most important systemic uh, medication that we use for uveitis are the systemic corticosteroids. These are the first line of therapy in patients with non-infectious ocular inflammatory diseases. They are inexpensive, they are potent, and they act very fast. These corticosteroids, they bind to the glucocorticoid receptors in the cytoplasm, and they, have a they bring about a change in the cellular response and thereby controlling the inflammation. So they are said to have anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects. They sequester lymphocytes to the bone marrow. They are inhibiting a lot of cell responses, and therefore the cell-mediated immunity, it is altered. 
It stabilizes the intracellular lysosomal membranes also reducing the neutrophil degranulation. So the indications are chronic bilateral diseases beyond the anterior segment, scleritis that has failed to respond to NSAIDs, severe inflammation that is too painful or destructive for allowing the initial therapy to fail, the eye diseases associated with systemic diseases for which systemic steroids are indicated and also supplementing the topical therapy. The relative contraindications to systemic steroids would be diseases which are likely to be exasperated by steroids such as diabetes, hypertension or psychiatric problems and in ocular we can have a contraindication in the form of pre-existing CSCR. In children relatively contraindicated as they hamper growth and therefore a low dose maintenance therapy can be used but it needs a very close monitoring. The preparations of steroids are multiple which are available but prednisolone is the most common form of steroid which is often used. We can also have intravenous uh, you know, use of systemic steroids which is known as the pulse therapy and it is very often given in the dose of 1 gram per day for 3 days found to be very useful in etiologies like VKH. It is also used when oral steroids fail to achieve acquiescence of ocular inflammation it's also used for vision threatening macular lesions and also in those situations where we need a rapid control of inflammation. So these are the guidelines to use a systemic steroids. Maybe you can take a pick of this where we start with 1 milligram per kg per day often in the dose of 60 to 80 milligrams per day and then a tapering schedule is used. Oral corticosteroids are often supplemented with calcium and with vitamin D. And this is something we have to keep in mind because there is always a risk of osteoporosis. So the induction phase is where you are going to be using a full dose of the systemic steroids in the dose of 1 milligram per kg and then you are going to gradually taper it. We are going to add immunosuppressive therapy if there is going to be no response after having started the corticosteroids for about 2 weeks to 1 month. And the tapering of course we are all very well aware of. When there's a reactivation, we may need to again step up the dose of the corticosteroids. The long-term corticosteroids is of course an option for severe diseases, that is the chronic inflammatory diseases. And we have to add immunosuppressive agents for steroid sparing effect if the suppressive dose is 7.5 to 10 mg per day or is above the threshold of the tolerability. There is a whole gamut of systemic uh, side effects of corticosteroids which have to be very much kept in mind and the most important being osteoporosis, ischemic necrosis of the femur, hypertension, hyperglycemia and weight gain. The oral corticosteroids of course are contraindicated in children and they can of course be used for a short term purpose for the induction phase but we very quickly shift them to immunosuppressants which are far safer in children because they are not going to hamper the growth of the children. And this is just one of my patients which has a huge choroidal TB granuloma and the patient of course was treated with intravitreal uh, injections of avastin and moxifloxacin which we are now doing very often along with systemic ATT and corticosteroids. Uh, but this patient had a paradoxical reaction as you find over here with the appearance of a new lesion and this apparently required the intervention in the form of intravenous methylprednisolone and stepping up of the oral steroids and you find that there is a complete regression of the granuloma with a recovery of 6-6 and 6 vision in the left eye. Now the steps to prevent side effects of corticosteroids is that you have to use minimal effective dose. We have to do a very close monitoring. We have to give supplements in the form of calcium and vitamin D and once a year DEXA bone densitometry testing is also recommended. Now when to consider adding a steroid sparing agent is when there is going to be uh, no response and when the patient is requiring uh, you know a long term steroid therapy which is going to be more than 3 months then of course we are going to be thinking of immunomodulatory or steroid sparing drugs. Coming to systemic immunosuppressive therapy this will be used when there is a failure of corticosteroid therapy to control inflammation. They are going to be used as corticosteroid sparing therapy to maintain control of inflammation while averting the greater toxicity of high dose of corticosteroids. 
The indications, of course, are several, but the most common being like Bechet's disease, sympathetic ophthalmia, birdshot retinochoroiditis, serpiginous choroiditis not associated with tuberculosis, necrotizing scleritis, and of course, uh, there are many more, as mentioned by me. These are the various groups of immunosuppressants, which are very commonly used in uveitis. But the basic guidelines, which we all need to remember in India, is that tuberculosis is very rampant, and we must rule out tuberculosis or underlying HIV before putting the patient on any kind of immunomodulatory drugs. Complete blood counts and platelet counts have to be repeated every four weeks. Now, which agent to use? What are going to be the certain principles? So, most commonly, it is recommended to start with anti-metabolites, anti something like a methotrexate or a mycophenolate mephitil or azothioprine. I think these are the most commonly used immunosuppressants in our clinics. Coming to alkylating agents, well, they are not very often used because of their toxic effects, though they do have a good efficacy, but they are mainly reserved for indications like vaginous granulomatosis or severe or refractory cases of uveitis requiring more than one drug. We have several biologics also, which are very commonly used, like infliximab, adalimumab, and etanoserpet. TNF-alpha inhibitors are also there, but they are less frequently used. They are used in severe cases where the conventional immunomodulatory therapy has failed. The first line therapy in selected uveitis cases like Bechet's disease, of course, they are the first line of drug. The challenges in India being that there's a potential risk of reactivation of latent tuberculosis and, of course, the cost of the treatment may be unaffordable to many of our patients. So these are the, this is the cost of the therapy of biologics, which probably is you know, not affordable to many of our patients. So five principles to remember for systemic therapy in uveitis is that you must rule out infection and malignancy as a cause of inflammation before you start the patients on steroids or immunosuppressants. We have to hit hard and hit fast in the form of induction phase with full dose of the corticosteroids to control inflammation. Maintenance with steroids or immunosuppressants is required for chronic inflammatory diseases. A regular monitoring is required for systemic side effects, which are very common with immunosuppressants and with the corticosteroids. And we must remember to shift children early to immunosuppressants because the corticosteroids, if used on a very long-term basis, can hamper the growth in these children. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, the IUSG session is primarily meant for comprehensive ophthalmologists and Manisha has very elegantly shown that corticosteroids still remain, uh, you know, the first line of therapy, though you have to be extremely careful when starting corticosteroids. So how many of you would use corticosteroids in your practice and any doubts, any you know, apprehensions are regarding the regimen of steroids. You are welcome to discuss anything at all about corticosteroids. So, are you all comfortable in using it? Because we are not, you know. So when we don't hear any apprehensions or questions, do we assume that there's no problem in using corticosteroids? Because these are very difficult areas which she's covered. They are not easy, you know. Starting immunosuppression, taking a decision to start biologics, immunosuppressive therapy are very, very difficult areas. So that is why we have put it up. <coughs> that if you have any sort of doubts, any questions without any inhibition, we are here to discuss it freely. So, I would still wait for anybody for any question because that's how the discussion is going to be. So, any question? Just ask. Yes, please. You want to see that slide again? She wants to see the dose of methotrexate. Methotrexate? Yeah. 
you know corticosteroids you start at a higher dose and then you bring it down gradually immunosuppression you start at a lower dose you monitor for the side effects and then you go up so these two are kind of uh, opposite to each other so methotrexate conventionally i think it's difficult okay he got yeah. it yeah go manisha go on so we start methotrexate in a dose of 7.5 to 12.5 mg per week uh, per week initially and the maximum dose can go up to 25 mg per week and this we give it along with folic acid methotrexate can be given orally or it can be given as a sub uh, subcutaneous injection the dose is once a week you have to give folic acid but please make sure the patient does not take folic acid on the day he receives methotrexate the two have to be on different uh, days that's very important so by and large roughly like manisha said we go up to 15 mg that's generally the standard dose unless for whatever reason the body weight the response to therapy or whatever it is you have to go up to 20 or 25 which is not every day but methotrexate by and large between 15 to 20 it works very well for children yes. with jia it's also used as a add on to adalubimab and biologics because it prevents the development of antibodies against biologics so it's used very commonly with that also and in children i think it is one of the safest immunosuppressants they can be on a long term on methotrexate and usually uh, you know for children it is said that the absorption is much better if it is given subcutaneously so when you are using it during the early phase of the treatment a subcutaneous injection is uh, preferred and once you find that the uveitis has become quiescent then probably you can shift to an oral dose just one last point we got mike Yeah, just one more point is like what Dr. Manish and Dr. Vishali said. Usually, doses beyond 20 milligrams. Most of the rheumatologists also prefer to shift to a subcutaneous dose because the bioavailability and the absorption is much better. Till 20, usually we end up safely giving them orally. For steroids, one more point to consider is that while we usually say that the dose is one milligram per kg weight, usually we should not go beyond 60 because if you do, then the risk of a septic necrosis of femur also ensues. So you have to ensure the fact. that you don't go beyond 60 so 60 usually is the upper safe limit till which we end up giving systemic steroids beyond that the adverse effects and uh, there is always a risk of an aseptic necrosis of femur and that can be extremely debilitating and very difficult to treat yeah But you can shift to ivmp yes. if required at that higher dose and another point i wanted to highlight that when you are dealing with the uh, ocular tuberculosis and the patient is on att then rifampicin apparently increases the metabolism of endogenous corticosteroids i find a number of patients coming where the clinician has very hesitantly started steroids because they feel that it may flare up the tuberculosis so they will start at something like a 0.5 mg per kg body weight on the contrary you have to actually increase it to 1.5 to 2 mg because the rifampicin is actually increasing the metabolism So there, you have to give it more than even one milligram per kg body weight. Otherwise, it's not going to be effective. Yeah, sure. That's what we are waiting for. Please use the mic. This is of like intermediate uveitis. You have ruled out the uh, uh, non-infectious cause of uveitis. So we start with steroids orally, and patient responds very wonderfully. Uh, you add topical and oral steroids. So we taper it over a period of a month, say, and then the CME and the vision, uh, CME improves, vision improves. You taper the steroids, you stop the steroids, continue on oral steroids. Uh, uh, so sorry, continue on the uh, I think topical steroids. But when you follow up the patient after a couple of months, the all you get is again reappears, and whatever investigations you've done systemically all turns out to be negative. So it's non-infectious. So, what is the time when should you restart the oral steroids in such cases, or shift them to a kind of immunosuppressors at that time? So, if you have diagnosed the patient as intermediate uveitis, which is unilateral, and your investigations all have shown that it is a non-infectious type of intermediate uveitis, so more or less this patient would require immunosuppression, even if you don't want to give it at the first stage. That is fair enough. 
So you treat the patient with local steroids and maybe depot steroids because the patient has cystoid macular edema. So your implant, posterior subtenon, canacot or whatever you take to reduce the edema. Now you said you will reduce it, taper it off within one month. Yes. So if you are using steroid as a monotherapy in this patient, the taper has to be slow. It cannot be that within one month you are done with it. It will take about 12 weeks, a gradual taper. Okay. If after 12 weeks, which is very rare that the disease will not come back and you will be able to get away with it with a single course of steroids. By and large, we expect the disease is going to come back. Now you go back and see your response to previous osotex. For example, if I had given deposteroid unilateral disease and at the time of three months when the effect of DEXA implant is weaning off, the macular edema is coming back, I might just be happy re-injecting it and still not giving immunosuppression because it's a unilateral disease. And we are, you know, risk-benefit ratio is in terms of DEXA implant but if the pressure has gone up if there is some problem due to DEXA implant if the patient cannot afford if the opposite eye is showing some leak on fluorescein angiography or whatever reason then this is the time you would put in immunosuppression because you know this patient you cannot maintain on very long term for steroids and the patient has recurrence when the steroids are being tapered. Ma'am, using immunosuppressives here will reduce the CME also in long term? Will use the... Will, will reduce the CME also? So uh, that is the second part which I was coming to that many a times you will have to hit a balance between the local addition of the therapy and systemic therapy. Immunosuppressant like azathioprine, methotrexate may be able to take care of some vasculitis which is seen in intermediate uveitis, keep the inflammation at control, but disappearance of CME though sometimes does happen will be uncommon. However, if on the first instance you have given local steroids to take care of CME and you have added immunosuppression, so by the time the uh, uh, by the time the effect of uh, local injection is weaning off, mm. immunosuppression has taken over. It is not allowing the CME to be reformed. So you can use immunosuppression to prevent the recurrences of CME. But once you have CME, that CME at any point of time, you will have to intervene Injectorine. with a uh, supplement it with local therapy. Maybe this time with an uh, IVT rather than an uh, implant. Absolutely. Whatever you decide. And whatever we, works and best we in your health. monitor such patients uh, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to restart these toys after three months and I'm planning to shift them to immunosuppressive. So you, yeah. you, you your slit lump evaluation of anterior vitreous phase also is more important here. Uh, that is a situation we all face from time to time where you know the inflammation is coming back but it it's not that severe that it needs a fire extinguisher you know what i mean so in that scenario you know you want to start immunosuppression but you also know that immunosuppression is going to take four six weeks to start working and the eye can't tolerate that much inflammation for that period of time so the options are two either you supplement the local steroids the local steroids will do the immediate thing and immunosuppression will take over or for any reason you want to give systemic steroids you plan a short term course okay you know okay. so you plan so a we short term we can again start with the full dose at after three months if you are starting then you always go full dose because if you do less than full dose they become anti-inflammatory then they do not have that immunosuppressive properties which you want to do. So you have to be sure for what you are giving steroids. If your purpose is to take care of, you know, the disease, then it has to be full dose. And as Dr. Manisha said that even if, you know, that's a different topic altogether when you are treating TB, if you want to add steroids or don't want to add but if you have to add steroids, go full dose. Don't do half of it because they 
neither leave you here mm-hmm. nor there yes thank you okay thank you thank you i think uh, uh, we are now at a stage where the two courses are kind of going together and uh, i will hand over to reema to finish off with the talk of dr mudit and so thank is you is dr neeta here okay fine go on reema sorry so meanwhile we'll have uh, dr mudit tyagi from he's a senior consultant in lv prasada institute hyderabad he'll be uh, sharing his experiences on his cases and you know talking on picking up clues from the fellow eyes so good afternoon once again and first of all let me thank dr reema for making me a part of this wonderful instruction course and also to dr vishali and all the course speakers and instructors in this course and to aios again for giving us a chance to talk about this now the beauty about uvitis is that in lot of these cases a good meticulous clinical examination and history can help us in coming to a diagnosis you do not necessarily have to resort to extensive lab investigations like what is commonly thought people confuse uveitis by saying that you need extensive lab investigations but the point is that the foundation of diagnosing uveitis is based upon a good history taking and a meticulous clinical evaluation and if you do that lot of times you will be able to arrive at diagnosis without resorting to extensive investigations so like i said take a meticulous history and always 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 check the fellow eye and let me show you a few examples so this was a patient who presented to the clinics with this retinitis lesion over here one more sclerosis vessel somebody had initially thought of this to be a post fever retinitis but then the mistake which they did was they did not look at the other eye now this is a unifocal retinitis and while your differentials may include toxoplasmosis post fever retinitis and whatever else you might think the moment you cast a look at the other eye your diagnosis becomes absolutely straightforward this is what the other eye had you had a healed toxoplasmosis scar so you have a heel scar in one eye you have a retinitis in the other eye you already know that you are dealing with a toxoplasmosis lesion we treated the patient with bactrim ds patient's lesion healed immediately so the point is if you had looked at the other eye you would not even have had a confusion about what you are dealing with another case this was a known case of non hodgkins lymphoma presented to our clinics with no pl vision 60 year old lady with a decreased vision for the last 2 months now this is the left eye where most of the retinal details are obscured by the extensive vitreitis and the opacities which you have but if you look at this other eye you see this lesion over here you see this blood hemorrhages you see this retinitis lesion this is already a known case of non hodgkins lymphoma patient is immunosuppressed you see these retinitis lesions with hemorrhages and your diagnosis probably becomes clear you are probably dealing with a viral component a cmv retinitis we went ahead did a vitrectomy took a biopsy the reason we took a biopsy was because sometimes in these cases even a intraocular lymphoma can present like this rarely but the point is the biopsy came positive the pcr came positive for cmv but again looking at the other eye gives us a clue to what we are dealing with so while the left eye vision or the features may be obscured by the vitreitis looking at the right eye shows you this clear viral retinitis picture this was a patient with cmv retinitis was treated with intravital gancyclovir initially and subsequently oral well gancyclovir and subsequent to that the lesion started regressing you can't do much about the left eye there is already optic nerve infiltration and these extensive hemorrhages and damage to the retina but the right eye vision was salvaged until the last follow up she was maintaining a visual acuity of 2020 this is a third case this patient again came to a clinic with extensive these multiple miliary lesions which were obscured a little bit by the vitreitis but these miliary lesions in itself had given us a clue to probably what we are looking at we thought that we are dealing with ocular syphilis because that presents with these multiple miliary lesions but the right eye looking at the right eye absolutely confirmed the diagnosis you see this area of vasculitis and you see these multiple miliary lesions and ocd through these lesions subsequently showed us the presence of this full thickness involvement of retina a finding which we had earlier described as characteristic of ocular syphilis so again looking at both eyes makes our job easier gives us an opportunity to look at much more clinical details which we are seeing and also helps us in basically looking for subtle clues which might be obscured in the eye which you are seeing initially this is the fourth case again i am just showing you clinical examples to illustrate upon the fact that why is it important to check both the eyes and this is a patient who presented with this extensive vasculitis in the 
left eye but the other eye showed this area of subvascular pigmentation a sign which is of fun associated with tuberculosis we investigated the patient the patient came out to be positive for ocular tuberculosis and was treated on lines of tb vasculitis and the patient did end up doing well this is the another case this was a patient who came with this choroiditis lesions in the eye and you can see these multiple separate choroiditis lesions in the right eye but the left eye you see the left eye and you can see this serpiginous like choroiditis lesion which is classic clinical presentation again patient was mon2 positive treated on lines of serpiginous like choroiditis and then the lesions regress this is one more patient now this was a patient who presented with this extensive lesion and what you have to think is why does the other eye hold importance and this is one classical case this was a patient who came with extensive scarring this heme ridge over here and some details are obscured by the cataract changes but you can see this extensive changes in the left eye you can see this peripheral lesion over here again in the left eye and initially was thought of as uveitis was investigated the patient's oct revealed this area of scarring and cystoid changes over here but look at the right eye the right eye is absolutely normal and what you see are these pachycoroid vessels what you were seeing earlier was not a uveitis not any choroidal inflammation but was subretinal heme in a case of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy so this patient had pcv you have see this pachycoroid vessels in the oct which again help us in arriving at a diagnosis and overcoming the confounded features which you may see otherwise so with this examples i will conclude my talk and come back to the point always make it a habit to check both the eyes the other eye will often give you small subtle clues which will help you in arriving at a diagnosis and which will make your job easier and as clinicians it's our duty anyways to look at both eyes thank you so much so thank you murit um any questions i would also like to highlight that even if the other eye is asymptomatic we must dilate and see because many times we get these tubercular you know perivascular choroiditis scar just in the other eye or some kind of pigmentation and yeah that is what we had in the other case the one where we had that vasculitis lesion the other eye otherwise the patient was 22 okay even though the vision was 2020 in the other eye the periphery revealed those subvascular changes which helped us in basically realizing what we are dealing with the same holds true for the last case which i had shown the patient was 2020 in the right eye but an oct through that area showed us pachycoroid and then made us realize that we are not dealing with an inflammation but we were dealing actually with a polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy and those was per peripheral hemorrhages which we were seeing and not any choroidal lesion so thank you mudit we move on to the iusc simposium you want to discuss you're welcome nahi dr bis abhi aapka hai Absolutely, sir. In the second case, which eye did you do vitrectomy, uh, sir? Right eye or the left eye? No, we did a vitrectomy from the left eye. The no PLI. Yeah. Sir, can we uh, do some uh, intraocular procedure in the no PLI? Is it intraocular procedure as in a choroidal uh, biopsy? No, vitrectomy. Anything. Yeah, you can. You are doing a diagnostic vitrectomy. You see extensive vitritis. You see those cells in the eye. You all you need to do is go and take a sample. I would be if both the eyes have got signs of inflammation. I would probably be more comfortable in taking the sample from an eye which is anyways no PL. Yes. The reason you are doing a vitrectomy is basically to arrive at a diagnosis. Okay. Sir. Yeah. So what is important in, is that you take the consent of the patient and you explain, you counsel the patient accordingly that you are doing just for the benefit of diagnosis and not for improving the vision. Yeah. So you have to explain that this is not a therapeutic intervention. This is a diagnostic intervention. and it's always uh, better to do it in the worse eye because diagnostic vitrectomy in the right eye if it develops detachment god forbid yeah. so that's the seeing eye so when you are performing diagnostic interventions always choose the worse eye okay yeah. even in eyes where we are suspecting a tumor in both eyes or where you need to take a choroidal biopsy again like what ma'am said it makes sense to go and take a biopsy from the non seeing eye or from the worst eye you want to preserve the good eye so it makes sense for you to take a specimen from the other eye 